Oh crap. Um, so apparently you're going to get this as two videos uh, because I was uh, offline too long. Well, that's okay. Um, all right. So let's start over again with hypothesis generation and selection. All right. So our cues give us educated guesses, diagnoses, inferences of what's going on. We evaluate those hypotheses in our working memory for correctness. Um, then we uh, generate plans uh, and choices of action, right? So we're going to evaluate the information by what are the possible outcomes if I do X? What are the possible outcomes if I do Y? What are the possible outcomes if I do Z? Then we think about what are the likelihood of those outcomes. Um, uh, is it really probable that that's going to happen or it's really unlikely? We're going to think about it in terms of that. And we're going to think about the negative and or positive factors from the outcomes. And there can be both positive and negative fa factors um, associated with these outcomes. If we evaluate it and we say, man, all those outcomes are pretty bad, we're going to go back and generate a new plan that has new courses of action associated with it. All right, so our heuristics and biases in receiving and using cues. Well, first of all, we have a tendency to pay attention only to a limited number of cues. Um, part of that is Q primacy and anchoring. We're getting cues over time, but the first cues we get tend to have a greater weight with us. So we uh, often anchor on hypotheses that are supported by those initial cues, which we call the anchor anchoring heuristic. Okay, so the problem is, of course, just because cues were first doesn't mean they're the best. So that leads to inattention to our later cues. Uh, as the cues are changing over time, they're very likely to be ignored. Uh, the older information, though, again, may be less accurate. Maybe the first cues we got were just kind of random and actually have nothing to do with the situation that we end up needing to address. Uh, so, um, again, that older information may be less accurate, may have nothing to do at all with uh, what's going on. Q salience is obviously uh, uh, going to make a difference. It's more likely to capture attention and be given more weight if it is salient to what is going on. And, and of course, uh, that we can recognize that. All right, well, we may be uh, then overweighting unreliable cues. Um, we, uh, there's a tendency always to simplify things by acting as though all cues are equal, right? And again, some of them may be incomplete may be unreliable, it may be a, a generally a fuzzy cue.
So we often give too much weight to that unreliable, incomplete, or fuzzy information. Uh, all right, so heuristics and biases in hypothesis generation, evaluation, and selection. Um, first of all, we're only going to generate a limited number of hypotheses. This, be, uh, this comes because, first of all, we've got working memory limits. So probably the most hypotheses we'll uh, generate at a time are one to four hypotheses. If there's time pressure, we may only consider one hypothesis. So the first option that is, uh, or hypothesis that's thought of by an expert is likely to be good, but not for novices. Uh, all right, so next is the availability heur heuristic. It's easier to use hypotheses that we have recently or frequently considered. Um, okay, so, uh, so having frequently considered it or recently considered it means it's more on the top of our mind. Then we have the representativeness heuristic. Uh, that would be a pattern of cues looks like some kind of prototypical example of this situation. Um, it can be uh, uh, very biasing if the situation is slightly different than our prototypical example. Or, of course, it might be our situation might be wildly different than our prototypical example. Our, uh, our fourth bias is overconfidence. Um, people believe they are correct more often than they actually are. That means that they are less likely to see, seek evidence that would uh, interfere with their initial assessment. And uh, obviously, if their initial assessment is wrong, it can be a problem. All right, our fifth bias is cognitive tunneling. A hypothesis is generated or chosen, but then subsequent cues that might contradict that are not utilized. Uh, so we have a hypothesis. We focus so uh, closely on that hypothesis that we um, uh, then don't uh, pay attention to subsequent cues. Um, so, tunneling can be avoided when we look at items beyond their normal use. Um, the uh, authors bring up the idea of um, Apollo 11, uh, Apollo 13, the movie, where the guy comes in to all the NASA ground personnel he dumps out a box. He says, this is everything that the astronauts have to work with. Figure out how to make this work, um, uh, essentially, so they don't die. <clears throat> um, this is also something that we do um, in terms of uh, uh, solving problems often. 
Um, so, for example, one of the things that uh, I like to do is to try to repurpose items, not necessarily use them for their original intended purpose, but to see the hidden potential within them to use them for something else. And our sixth uh, bias is confirmation bias. That's where we seek out only confirming information for our hypothesis. And one place that we see that in America right now is that um, uh, is that people are so wedded to being a Republican or being a Democrat that they don't look at anything that might mean that their guys are not perfect, right? So you got the Trumpistas. Um, they only focus on the good things uh, that President Trump has accomplished. Then you've got the Democrats who are only focusing on the good things or the good qualities of Democratic uh, candidates or politicians. Mm. Pardon me. This leads to a situation where the tendency is we're not going to remember or we're going to underweight anything that goes against our uh, uh, our uh, uh, what we have chosen as our position or our hypothesis. Um, all right. <clears throat> So, what are the heuristics and biases in our action selection, right? So, that last section was about generation of hypotheses and alternatives. Now we're thinking about action. Uh, one uh, bias that we might have, we only retrieve a small number of actions, when actually there are more or even many more actions that could be taken. Um, this is something you see quite often where people tell you, oh, you, they, you've only got two choices. You can either vote Republican or you can vote Democrat. Well, I say, hell no. I've been voting Libertarian uh, for bloody hell, 30 years now. Um, oh, more than that, 40 years now. Um, right? So there are always alternative actions that uh, go unconsidered. Some of them, because they're just so wild, you would never consider them. So there's also an availability heuristic for actions. Again, that goes to frequency uh, of using that same action, recency of thinking about or doing that action, that the action is strongly associated with the hypothesis you've chosen. Uh, but sometimes we are able to make checklists checklists uh, to overcome the availability heuristic. So, for example, uh, the example the book uses is um, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, what they do in aviation, where if you get into an emergency situation, you pull out a checklist and the co-pilot's reading it off uh, to the pilot, and he's going, all right, check, we got that, we got that, we got the uh, engines at idle, you know, whatever it is. 
All right, so we often also think when we're thinking about actions uh, about what are the possible outcomes. Rare outcomes we rarely think about. Um, uh, but, of course, just because they're rare doesn't mean they don't happen. If they didn't ever happen, we would call them impossible outcomes. Uh, so, uh, so one of the uh, uh, one of the things they talk about in the book is wearing a hard hat on a construction site. Now, uh, there may be places where. Uh, you wear a hard hat and every day you say, thank God I was wearing a hard hat um, um, because uh, it stops uh, damage to your head because a lot of things are, are falling down or sparks are flying and you don't want to set your hair on fire. I hate when that happens. We need to remember, though, all outcomes are probabilistic, right? Uh, the chances may be one in a thousand or one in a million, but that still means there is a chance that that outcome could happen. One thing that happens with outcomes is we see hindsight bias or I knew it all along, uh, where we, uh, after the fact, we say, oh, I knew that would happen, when in fact we knew nothing of the kind. Uh, so, often operators get blamed for things that happen that are only op uh, obvious in hindsight. Um, in fact, a lot of times in aviation accidents, they um, uh, they end up blaming the accident on pilot error, when it may not have been at all obvious to the pilot that uh, that they were making an error. Um, all right. Our decision makers are not likely to retrieve all outcomes. In fact, they're unlikely to re retrieve all the outcomes, right? Some things um, uh, you end up um, uh, not retrieving, maybe because it's low probability, maybe it's because you don't have experience uh, enough with it, um, but uh, you are, um, uh, but particularly when there are a lot of outcomes, you're not likely to uh, retrieve them all, right? If we're talking about a Bernoulli trial, well, we say there, there are only two outcomes. You're likely to retrieve all of those, right? But when we start talking about something where there are a lot more outcomes, again, you're not likely to retrieve them all. And there's a tendency to follow the satisficing model. In other words, um, you... Uh, Think about outcomes until you get one that you think is good enough or the most likely. All right, and the uh, last bias here is uh, the framing bias. How the situation is presented is going to influence your uh, position, uh, your decision, excuse me. Uh, so for, for example, um, 
Uh, the example they use in the book that is interesting is, um, uh, careful there, kitty, don't, uh, the cat is trying to uh, be my technical crew and move the camera around. Um, so, um, if we say, would you like to buy this hamburger that is 10% fat? people are going to put a lower value on that than if you say, would you like to buy this hamburger? It's 90% lean. Um, the same way if it's a decision uh, about having a surgery. If you say 20% of people that have this surgery die, uh, that's going to be a much different uh, a frame for your decision than you have an 80% chance of recovery from this surgery. Um, one framing bias that I talk about a lot in, uh, uh, in um, uh, engineering economy is the sunk cost bias, right? A decision is made because um, uh, because a lot of money has already been sunk in. Uh, we're going to continue this pro uh, project because we've already spent $50,000, even when it's obvious that the project is not going to pan out the way we thought it would. Or um, the, uh, uh, the famous example I like to quote is um, uh, my friend Harlan had a, a garage sale with his wife. And at the end, they're counting up the money. And uh, Harlan's going, all right, we got $850. And that stuff only cost us $20,000. Uh, well, it may have cost 20000 but the value now of that was not 20000 The value essentially was negative because all that stuff had to be kept and stored uh, and preserved uh, if it was going to continue in their, uh, uh, in their possession. All right, so the benefits of heuristics and the cost of biases. Um, so our inexperienced um, uh, decision makers only generate a limited number of alternatives. Um, Right, that may be on a probabilistic basis or they're inexperienced, they don't know all the alternatives available. But often that leads to poor decisions and the best alternatives are overlooked. Um, so, but our Oh, it should be adopt. Our experts adopt uh, decision making and they avoid the heuristics uh, when they're going to lead to um, uh, when they're going to lead to poor decisions. So a heuristic or a rule of thumb might tell you that something is the normal practice. But the experts are going to realize, okay, that would be the normal practice, but this is an abnormal situation uh, compared to uh, compared to that heuristic. Uh, 
And so I'm not going to use that heuristic. All right. Uh, well, that's as far as I prepared. And I am uh, somewhat sure y'all don't want me to... Um, Well, this is a good time to stop because the the next um, the next part of the chapter starts a major part, and we've really pretty much used up our time. Again, any questions send to me by email, um, and of course I'll do my best to um, uh, to answer those. Um, Please stay safe, stay sane, and when the fields are white with daisies, we'll meet again. Have fun now.